Remember that story about Cindy you-know-who? When her Christmas was stolen, she knew what to do. Why, Santa Claus? Why? But what if I said that's not how it went down? <laughs> Hey everyone, it's Jonathan and welcome back to Every Version Ever. This time we're talking about a movie that I didn't even know existed until I started putting this series together. A horror movie parody of The Grinch called The Mean One. Like I said a few episodes ago, I first had this idea for the series a while ago. In fact, I first had the idea to cover every version of The Grinch long before I had the idea for this entire podcast. I think it was around the time that the Illumination version of the story came out. I thought it'd be fun to review all the versions, and I found an article detailing all the different Grinch media that was out there, so I bookmarked it for later. Well, now it's like six years later, and I'm finally doing it, so of course I go back to that article and I see it's been updated. There have been two more adaptations since 2018, one of them a musical, which we'll get back to later, and one of them is this film, which takes the idea of the character of the Grinch, and instead of having him be a curmudgeonly introvert who lives in a mountain and comes down to steal Christmas, they decide that this Grinch is now a raging psychopath who lives in a mountain and comes down to violently murder anyone who celebrates Christmas. So, like, just a loose adaptation. This sounded hilariously awful, and even though I didn't technically even want to watch this thing, I am a completionist when it comes to the podcast, so I decided I had to cover it. And this movie is one of the main reasons I decided I had to get Nikki from Trivial Theater and Dan from TYTD Reviews to join me for the rest of this series. They both love covering obscure and terrible movies, particularly horror movies, so this seemed like the perfect combination of everything they might want in a film. And with them, I always have a great time talking about terrible movies, even if I don't personally like them. So I figured having them along would make it all worth it. Time to roast this beast. <laughs> Well, this movie, <laughs> I actually liked it more than I thought I was going to. <laughs> like, I didn't like like it, but I thought I was going to hate it and groan through it and be just disgusted by it. But it was actually so stupid that it made me laugh a lot. <laughs> <laughs> So I have to ask both of you, you put this in the uh, 2000s Grinch in a room, which one comes out on top? I'm watching the meme one. <laughs> <laughs> that was really no quick. <laughs> like, they're both in an airlock. That that Jim Carrey Grinch is going out into space, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, I grew up with Jim Carrey Grinch, so I'm keeping him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm in the no, I, I, Go ahead. Oh, so uh, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I agree with Jonathan on this one. Um, I was very, very hesitant going into this film. I, Having seen a lot of quote, horror parodies, films that kind of take uh, either try and do funny horror or films that take intellectual properties that have recently entered the public domain and try and do a horror version of them, um, the quality is normally atrocious and i was i was very hesitant to hit play because i was kind of sitting there thinking even even though bad films are my bread and butter there are some things that even i <laughs> will not venture into if i don't <laughs> and these are things like um winnie the pooh blood and honey or um they're doing a Mickey Mouse film, like a Steamboat Willie horror film soon. They're also doing a Bambi one. Yep. And a Pinocchio. Oh. <laughs> oh. It'll never beat Bambi versus Godzilla, which is one of my favorite short films. Um, <laughs> the thing is only like 30 film. seconds. I went to find it one time. I was thinking it was going to be like an actual short movie, and it was just <laughs> over in just a few seconds. I was like, what? <laughs> that was it? <laughs> How else would it go? It's a tiny deer versus a 60-foot lizard with radioactive breath. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I was very hesitant with the mean one. Um, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to get into, and I came away pleasantly surprised. I actually enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. Um, is it perfect? No. It it does have its flaws. Um, 
But I think the thing that, that caught me off guard the most is just how technically proficient as a work it is. Like, given this is a low no like a low bordering on maybe mid budget production i was really expecting it to look incredibly cheap mm -hmm. and it doesn't yeah um it maybe overuses stock footage a little bit too much there's quite a few kind of shutter stocky things but... i wondered about that the the scene oh. the scene where they're like showing people looking at their phones so it's like are they just buying stock footage off of like shutter stock or whatever it's yeah, like, are yeah. they just buying random stock footage and using it in this movie? <laughs> I'm just going to say it. There are, I, I could name you one, at least one movie that came out in the past year that used like terrible use of stock footage and starring Neil Breen in it. Nothing on this. <laughs> but this was, it, it felt a little weird to see those kinds of shots in amongst all this because it really it wasn't needed. And I have thoughts on the last 10 minutes, but I will save those <laughs> thoughts. No, absolutely. But but yeah, I mean I, I genuinely was quite taken aback at just how how much quality was kind of there. Like there's clearly a consistent vision in terms of how they wanted the film to look. So creatively it's I won't say it's anything mind blowing. It's not pushing the envelope for the genre, but it it's sturdy. It's doing what it needs to do to kind of get through the motions. I was very impressed with the lighting setups on this. They they seem to really work with shadow play quite well in in certain scenes. Um, you know, the characters are fairly well written. You know, they're not massively like charismatic. Again, I I, I can't say that I, you know, fell in love with any of the characters particularly, but they at least have some degree of depth which is nice they do try to explore and build on the characters throughout the runtime which is a lot more than can be said for most films that kind of fit this ilk and budget yeah I, I came away from it pleasantly surprised but not thrilled and um i'm gonna let triv um speak in detail about the last 10 minutes because i too <laughs> also had problems with the last 10 minutes or so and i think given my massive um apocalyptic rant about jim carrey's the grinch in our last uh episode um that i should probably let um Trev have her network <laughs> moment as well well do you want to talk about the rest of the movie first and then get to the last 10 yeah yeah because the first part of the movie i felt like i was watching a hallmark film except there was killing in it <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more red than your average uh christmas Hall hallmark movie which is saying something it really did feel like a hallmark movie because i've watched a bunch of those either doing just the things i've done with rachel because rachel has a whole hallmark dedicated podcast so i've watched a bunch oh, yeah. of hallmark movies so much of this felt like something from one of those movies, be it the cheesy dialogue or the forced schmaltziness. Just it felt like a Hallmark movie, except then somebody gets stabbed through the head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what happens when they stop rolling. They just cut those bits out of the Hallmark movies. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you should see the uh, the R-rated cut of those Hallmark films. They get pretty wild. <laughs> well, I, I, as I was watching it, like, I don't watch a whole lot of these types of things. I don't generally like horror movies. And I think I went into this thinking that it was going to be more serious than it was. And it, it almost, at a certain point, I was like, this feels more like a parody of The Grinch and this type of movie than an actual sincere horror movie. And then, <laughs> like... The, the scene where she, they they her mom gets killed by this monster and then as an adult she goes back to this town and then you have the scene where this thing shows up and kills her dad and then like all of the de Christmas decorations of the house start getting ripped down and sucked into the chimney <laughs> and I was just like burst out <laughs> laughing at how dumb this was I was like what is this movie <laughs> and then later on she goes to the hospital and the there's a weird mayor for whatever reason. And like as soon as the mayor showed up, I was like, well, this person is here to die. <laughs> and then the, <laughs> the, congratulations on identifying that. The, <laughs> she's like in her hospital bed ranting about this thing. And she's like, what if he's coming after me after all of us? What if he's coming to steal our Christmas? And at that point I was like, 
<laughs> okay, this is basically like that Santa Jaws movie that I watched a few years ago. This is not supposed Yay. to be a serious horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> so the scene you mentioned where um, the 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 mean one comes after Cindy's uh, dad and he rips all the Christmas decorations up and she ends up at the hospital, I thought was infinitely enhanced by the fact that um, the sheriff for the town turns up and basically says multiple times to her please stop talking about this mysterious monster killing people people will think you're crazy <laughs> to which she responds in a very hysterical way saying no it was definitely the monster from 20 years ago that killed my mom he's back he killed my dad and he's definitely going to steal christmas i was like if you're trying to prove you're not crazy you just failed hey she was going through some traumatic stuff give her a break <laughs> There's a time and a place, though. You, if somebody said to me, um, you need to prove that you're not crazy, and I went, but the fish, they're in the walls. Um, that, I mean, who are you to say that they're short... not? I mean, you know, there could be fish ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> I just I, I, yeah, at least play sane. You can be crazy after the fact, but give it at least five seconds. Don't immediately follow up that you need to stop talking about the monster or people will think you're crazy with crazy. <laughs> that, that's not going to make people go, okay, well, she's clearly on the level. <laughs> fair point, fair point. <laughs> <laughs> On that subject as well, I, it's it's one of the disappointments that I did have with this film is that they, and I, I wrote this on my letterbox review for it, I, one of the things that is a problem with, with the film overarchingly, at least in my opinion, um, was the fact that they don't really seem to know what type of horror they want to be, so they kind of smorgasbord it a little bit, they do a little bit of everything, but they never fully develop any of it so yeah. i mean the big one that i thought was a bit disappointing is um they play a little bit on psychological horror they suggest that they imply a little bit that um the mean one is is just a, a creation of cindy's mind and that she isn't real and they start questioning whether cindy is actually crazy or not but they never really develop it past a couple of people gently alluding to it and maybe a couple of nightmare sequences. And I just, I feel like it would have been a much more interesting film had they more swerved into that style and you genuinely are sitting there for most of the runtime going, you know, is she the killer? Has she manifested this mean one as a kind of, you know, trauma response? Is, is you know, to, to be able to question the film a bit more, um, but but around about twenty minutes, and they more or less a hundred percent confirm. No, there is a literal green man in the mountains killing people to take their Christmas lights, um, <laughs> which sounds mad. But I can assure you, I'm not mad. There are fish in the walls. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it was just the one aspect I think could have maybe had a little bit more development. Is is just picking an angle and and leaning into it a little bit more yeah. because it, they kind of they dip into everything, but they don't. It feels a bit non-committal. See, and I'm not sure if that's to its... Uh, and I guess I, I would add to that, I for a good chunk of the runtime, like you get um, Dr. Zeus or Doc in there, and, you know, he looks a lot like Santa, and I'm sure it was probably done on purpose to kind of be like, oh, is, you know, this guy Santa? Is, you know... My, my no the, when I was writing my notes, I just kept writing drunk Santa. <laughs> yeah, but my question was, like, I kind of came back to the fact that, okay... Like, you know, is he like a Jekyll and Hyde type thing where he's moonlighting as the Grinch? You know, like he's got mm. these two sides where he's actively trying to save people, but he's also like the thing that's causing all the issues. And obviously, I thought that would have been a cool route to go just because, I don't know, maybe it was, maybe it was, I'm sure it was done with the intention of being like, oh, dude, that looks like Santa. But it went literal, yeah. which is fine. It's. I think they could have gone other ways. I did appreciate some of the stuff that they did with the Grinch at the end. There was other stuff that, you know, kind of torqued me off a bit, so. Yeah. I mean, as well as that, the the, the comedy element as well as a little non-committal too. Like, they they do little gags here and there. I mean, the absurdity of the situation is is probably the, the main comedy drive for it. But um, Drunk Santa, they, they give him some, like, zingers, but they, they're a bit scatter shot with the zingers they don't make it consistent so there's moments where he'll just like suddenly say some wacky catchphrase line and i go a guy just had his head cut off what what are you doing 
he's pulling at an ash from uh, Evil Dead. You know, funny you mentioned that. Actually, um, one of the films that that really drew my attention, pulled, you know, I pulled out of watching this film was Ash versus the Evil Dead. Um, particularly the scene in the bar where the mean one locks the bar up and just starts like picking them all off one by one. There is a scene in Ash versus the Evil Dead where they go to a deli or, or some kind of sandwich shop, um, and it's it's incredibly chaotic, but like it's it's almost one to one in terms of editing and cinematography. Really? Th- those two sequences. Yeah, yeah. Oh. There's um like there's a scene in the mean one where they feed a woman into a mincer that is <laughs> shot almost I and she's screaming even though her top half is gone. Oh, that's just her colon <laughs> doing its thing. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a uh, there's a scene in Ash vs Evil Dead in the sandwich shop scene that's literally shot one to one more or less the same, but it's with a, a meat slicer rather than a, a mincer. Oh, they, they put somebody on it. And, yeah, ow. yeah, yeah. I was gonna say in that scene, the the, the guy in the inflatable um, Christmas tree outfit. Yeah, I highly enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> <Just> like... <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> I will say, I think that was probably. Of all the stuff that happened, I think that was the one scene that stood out as my personal favorite, just because it was the movie wasn't it wasn't terribly paced, but this was this was like the one part that felt like really well paced to me. Agreed. In fact, I did have a question for you, Triv, because I think you've seen. Have you seen Terrifier? Yes. I haven't seen Terrifier yet. Did you feel like there was any influence in this from that? Well, the guy, the guy who plays the mean one is the guy who plays the Terrifier. Oh, uh, what's his name? David something Thoreau. Like, I haven't seen the Terrifier, uh, but I looked up the actor right, and I no. recognized the clown that showed up when I Googled him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, my only question would be, when did one come out versus when did the other come out? Let's see. Mean one. Uh, let me check that for you. 2016 Terrifier and the mean one was 2022. 22. Oh, yeah, no, I, I would totally say for the kind of... Well, let's put it this way. The violence that you have in the mean one matches the general sense of the Terrifier, but Terrifier was a great deal more gruesome. This would be like a like a heavy PG versus a like middle of the road rated R, maybe more so. Because Terrifier 2 goes way far beyond that as far as like the, the gore aspect of things. But yeah, no, I think that this is it maybe PG, like a light PG-13 compared to an R if you're comparing the mean one to Terrifier, because there's some pretty nasty mm. gore in Terrifier. Um, but I mean, the, there's stuff in this, but it's doesn't, it doesn't quite hit that same level. No, I was going to say, because I've only ever seen clips from Terrifier, I haven't got around to watching it yet, but the, the, the general vibe of Terrifier felt almost like it aligned a little bit with this one, but oh, obviously yeah. having not seen it, I wasn't. Sure, so I thought I'd ask the expert. <laughs> I, I would say that it definitely has vibes of that. Like, if everything was on the same general level as the chick going through the, the grinder, you would have a lot more. Or that, not necessarily that same thing, but so, that similar level of, of heavy gore. Then you would have something that's more in line with Terrifier. But the spirit of the stuff where it's kind of, uh, whimsical is not the right word, but kind of off kilter. You know, it's not just a... It's not just a knife through your head. It's a it's a it's a shishko, It's a it's a kebab through your head with the kebab still attached. If that makes sense, yeah. like it's it's that kind of gore. If you're talking terrifier, right? Okay, so this is this is almost like the um, the slightly more family acceptable version of terrifier. <laughs> oh well, family <laughs> acceptable is is uh, relative, I guess, in this case. But yeah, no, it has it has vibes of that. But yeah, it, you you get you get the idea. They could, they belong in the same general world. Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering now that Jonathan as well mentioned that it's the same actor who plays the Grinch in this that play Art the Clown. Whether that was intentional, maybe, like maybe they thought, oh well, we we can you know bank on the fact that we've got you know the guy who plays Art the Clown playing our main bad guy. So maybe if we lean into it a little bit and push it in the marketing, we we can maybe bring some people in who who are big Terrifier fans. So. And I, I'm sure it's like anything, you know, how you have those, um, you know, a lot of people take like um, Psycho as a as an inspiration and kind of pull bits of that into different things. I think you could say the same thing for something like this, one way oh, yeah. or the other. Well, even if it is based somewhat on the Terrifier movies, I feel like it's more based on the Jim Carrey Grinch. <laughs> oh, uh, well, looks alone on that one. 
I was not expecting that. Like, I thought this was just a horror movie of just like the Grinch in general. I don't, I don't know why. I just did not expect this to be basically Jim Carrey's Grinch, except murdering people. But he has like all the mannerisms too. And like, there's the scene where he's crawling across the floor on his fingertips. <laughs> It's like, this is just Jim Carrey, but evil. <laughs> and there's a there's a distinct Dollar Tree vibe about this movie. You've got, uh, obviously, Dollar Tree Jim Carrey playing the Grinch. Um, kind of, yes. Yeah, yeah. Cindy's dad looks like Dollar Tree Malcolm McDowell, I thought. Um, the love interest, the police officer love interest, I thought looked like Dollar Tree Paul Rudd. I it's briefly just, thought every, it was every one him, of these films. And then, he, then he like moved to set. I was like, "Oh, it's not him." <laughs> yeah, like this whole film was just been like, "Is that?" And then, "Oh no, no, okay, fair enough." <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just looking at a bloody disgusting article, um, kind of connecting Terrifier and um, Mean One, or if there were any connections. Um, with the unprecedented success of Terrifier, to Art the Clown cemented his place as a horror icon in the modern age. While the Terrifier franchise has become synonymous with Halloween, art actor David Howard Thornton is slashing Christmas with the mean one. So uh, from a holiday perspective, yes. Um, that, so this this article is saying those hoping for a Terrifier-style 80s throwback slasher are likely to be frustrated by the mean one as it plays like a sci-fi mockbuster of the Grinch that stole Christmas. It's, it's unlikely to spawn a cult that as voracious as Terrifier, and that's kind of what they said about it, so... So yes, but no. Yeah, it, it probably did definitely take inspiration because of the success of Terrifier franchise. Yeah. Although I think Art the Art the Clown is going to be coming back, or Terrifier three is I think uh, at least at one point was going to be a Christmas type movie. So I think it still is. You know, is it? I hadn't. I, yeah, I wasn't yeah, but, sure, but uh, for, for somebody who hasn't seen any of the Terrifier films, I I know a surprising amount of bits <laughs> and pieces about the Terrifier movies. Um, yeah, apparently Terrifier Three is going to be um, like holiday themed. They've, oh, they've shown okay. that they've got a few trailers and clips of it, but yeah, it's basically Art the Clown does Christmas, which I'm sure is going to be a real stretch for the guy who plays Art the Clown, given <laughs> that he's already basically done this that. Was his practice so, movie. Well, it's all, you know, he was, yeah, he had a mask on for the mean one. So, I mean, he just has to, you know, add some tinsel and call it a day, you know? Yeah, sorted. <laughs> Maybe hang a couple people up like their mistletoe? Could be. Yeah, that was a kind of a random tangent, but you know. <laughs> Another thing that, I, one of my biggest laughs of the film, besides the thing sucking all the Christmas stuff up the chimney, was towards the end, like you have Cindy, you have this whole ridiculous training montage of her playing like rock versions of Carol of the Bells while she's punching a fake Grinch and learning how to shoot guns. And then she goes after the Grinch with the drunk Santa and the deputy. <laughs> and then like towards the end, she says, it's time to roast this beast. <laughs> 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 just they they really forced in a ton of Grinch puns and references into this movie, but that one was the one that got me. <laughs> it was so dumb. I just laughed out loud. Yeah. <laughs> I did enjoy the narrator. I thought that he he added some fun bits. I, I had a love hate relationship with him. I I think when he hit, he was really good, and I thought it def definitely enhanced the film. I do feel that by the third act, he'd been over-egged a little. I think that they could have put tone back just a smidge and I'd have been happier. But yeah, I agree. I think that when he the, the way he delivers the lines was delightful. And I think that when he does pop up and he's got some good lines to go through, it's a real winner. For me personally, the first act of this film is very strong. I think they, they set everything up quite nicely. Um, Technically, it's it's very much on my level. Um, it almost wrong foots you because, like you said, like I said, I was expecting to come into this and it to be cheap and cheerful, but kind of rubbish. And it it surprised me actually that it was a little bit self aware, a little bit silly, mm -hmm. um, but you know had a level of competency behind it almost. Around about halfway through the second act, I've started to feel like it was slowing down a little bit, and it was kind of losing its momentum, losing its steam. You know, things were taking a bit longer to resolve. You, there were some scenes that felt a little bit padding esque in there, um, and I started to notice slightly ropey CGI 
filler effects like CGI blood cropping in here and there. And then it almost feels like the money ran out by the time they got to the third act and they were just kind of shoving whatever they could in to make it work. <laughs> like the the part with the website where it's all very badly photoshopped evidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's like basically every other scene, it's, it started to turn into an Ed Wood movie. Every other scene is stock footage or really dodgy CGI effects. Like there's a bit near the end where the house gets set on fire and every single shot where the fire is shown is CGI fire and it's CGI fire that's in the different resolution to the resolution of the <laughs> film footage. So, so it's like, oh no, this low-res fire is slowly eating the house. <laughs> I don't know, it just kind of feels like as the film went on, they had these grand ideas and they realised they didn't have the money to kind of realise it. So, like, I mean, I was hoping that the final kind of sh showdown between Cindy and the mean one would maybe be a bit more involved. And the second the action moved back to the house, I thought, oh, that's a, a bit of a shame because it's, it's just going to be a home invasion type finale. Um, and, you know, th th that kind of ending to a film has been done to death you know quite literally you know it was it was a little bit done by the 80s so 2022 it's very much had its day but like the ex the, the thing that got me and the thing that really kind of made made this film lose a lot of its shine was probably the the final battle between Cindy and the mean one when they spill out into the street because it's literally just like 5 minutes of him punching her then her punching him then him punching her from like 26 different angles <laughs> And I know that they're trying to do that to make it look more interesting, but it still doesn't get away from the fact that it's just like really generic hand to hand combat mm. that doesn't really it it didn't feel like the grand ending this except she had a candy cane gun, so that has to count for something. <laughs> yeah, and a and a lit um very true. And they also had the lit the lit bat as well. It's uh their take on Lucille, the bat from uh uh The Walking Dead. Which I wonder where they plugged that bat into, because that was a lot of lights for one bat. <laughs> Um, if, if she she gave off Laura Croft vibes, like when she had like she had the candy striped bigger gun and then or the shotgun and then she had the candy striped like handgun. It's like you took time to candy stripe a gun. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Outside of obviously the trying to keep it all Christmas theme, but I was really hoping it was. You're right though. The the end bits you could have had fun and really done for like. Home Alone, you know, they everything has, you know, a Christmas sort of theme and it 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 all kind of works. You could have done like grenades with the the um the or the um Christmas ornaments. You could have done throwing stars with the like the the star toppers and uh -huh. stuff. It felt and I, again, I understand budget plays in, but Christmas ornaments are not expensive. You can get them at the dollar store and, you know, add sound effects to make them all sound deadly and, such. and some low res explosions. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I did have to laugh at. There was a couple of like uh, like one offs uh, from different people, and they were they were so goofy. I think it, um my favorite though it was at one of the diners, and I thought it was right before the the people came in and they had, like the the big killing spree, but it might not have been. No, I'm sorry, it wasn't. It was there was a one cook, and he was standing there doing his thing, and he, he holds up these jingle bells, and he's like. Dag, he's on the phone. He's like, Dag Nabbit, I asked for bell peppers, not jingle bells. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what, what? And then, like, the guy comes over with bell peppers like two minutes later. It's like, where were you that you had this thing? <laughs> there was another one, um, the deputy and, and Cindy. Uh, he goes, uh, they're talking back and forth, and she says, did Frankenstein kill your grandma? And he goes, well, actually, Frankenstein wasn't the monster. And it's like such a random bit. <laughs> it's like, what were you on when you came up with some of these? <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing. It's, it's On the whole, it's not a bad film. There's the 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 feeling I was left with by the time the credits rolled was that it was just above fine, but I would struggle to say I it was good. I enjoyed mm -hmm. it, but I, I don't think it would be one that I could hand on heart be like, oh yeah, you got to see this. It's great. It was just kind of one where I got to the end and I went, you know what? I might if this was on TV and I was channel hopping, I might stick around and see what happened. It, it has its moments. I yeah, it it was fine. 
It was it was an all right film, apart from the ending, which um, again, <laughs> Trev, you can probably. Well, uh, um, for me, I I I was expecting, and I I think I'm a little cynical because you do get to like you know, and I I had moments of enjoyment with Pooh, Blood and Honey. I you know there were moments that it was fine, um, but I was assuming that this was going to be just a christmas version of that so the fact that it wasn't i guess my expectations were kind of in the basement so i was pleasantly surprised by how well put together it was given the kind of movie that i was expecting i did enjoy and i guess spoilers for how the grinch goes out but his heart growing three times actually killed him which i thought was pretty i enjoyed that ending i thought that was a fun take the the way they set it up i was at first very confused i was like why on earth are they trying to do a redemption for this thing and then having her kiss his cheek and then i was like oh wait a minute they're setting up his heart growing three sizes his heart's gonna explode isn't it (laughs) (laughs) it was so dumb but i guess it works because of the kind of movie this is (laughs) Absolutely. And therein lies the thing. It, it it makes sense in universe, even though it doesn't make sense anywhere else. <laughs> yeah. um, but I guess the rest of it, like outside of that, like Dan said, the, the last half of the battle got it overstayed its welcome. Um, the whole like social media bit where people are talking about going and it was probably like a Kickstarter thing where they had people come on. But it just if they had just left it where he's dead because his heart exploded that would have been all you needed. I don't think you needed more than that. Mm. And the, just the amount of stock footage and all the rest at the end, it just kind of, it felt like such a filler thing. So the, the the very, very end of the film, again, spoilers to anybody who wants to check this one out, but um, I, I agree with you completely up to the very, very, very last shot. So the very, very last shot of the film, they pan back over to the mountain where the mean one is supposed to live, and you hear him cackle, and it's the typical horror trope of he's not really dead, he's coming back. And I simultaneously hated and loved it. I hated it in terms of the self-contained movie because I thought that it threw away the one good thing that this film did. But what I loved about it is that the potential now for a sequel wherein an entire brood of mean ones like cicadas are living in that mountain and are going to come out and destroy the town completely uh, you know just i was it, it almost took me full circle i was think just imagining hundreds of grinches just <laughs> storming down the mountain to level it and i just thought you know if they do a sequel that should be the angle they do it with. I just want complete absurdity. I don't want another sort of straight cut horror film. I want to see the equivalent of Tremors, but with Grinches. I want just hundreds of these green men destroying shops, eating Christmas lights, <laughs> rubbing onions on each other, wearing garters, <laughs> throwing people into fires and meat grinders. And I, I want well, it to fires. almost be like an. Yeah, low eight bit <laughs> fires, um, like Atari <laughs> level fires. Um, I want a surviving rabble of people, almost like an apocalypse movie, having to fight hundreds of Grinches. Um, that ends with a scene where they blow the mountain up because they find out that there's actually thousands of Grinches in the mountain waiting to be hatched. They, they should make a sequel based on Halloween as Grinch Night. <laughs> oh God! Oh my God! How many people have to go use the euphemism? (laughs) I kind of hate this idea, but love it at the same time, and I would actually watch this. (laughs) I would add one other addendum if we're doing a sequel. There was the one kill, I think it was of the mayor, where she ends up having her eyes gouged out and ribbon, or like bows, put in place of them. And it was creepy. It was actually quite creepy, um, given everything else. The thing that this movie lacked above everything else is it's kind of like Willy's Wonderland or um yeah Willy's Wonderland. It had such potential to use all of these things as you know all these pieces from Christmas as ways to kill people, and they they didn't really lean into that, and I I feel mm. like that's a loss. Yeah, if they're gonna do a sequel, every single kill or as many as possible should be based on that. Like you look at Jack Frost and I know that's I'm talking about the horror Jack Frost, not the Michael Keaton one. <laughs> um, they used like Christmas stuff so well in there to to kill people and to to make it a fun, like just campy horror movie. And 
this felt like it like you said it's trying to live in both worlds where it is a parody of um you know the the jim carrey grinch it's it's sci-fi level goofy but they just they didn't commit enough in any one direction to really make it stand out as something that is memorable now trev i will have to hold you up here and say the writer of this film was flip cobbler he has 13 writing credits his biggest credit was the hunchback of notre dame 2 um, well that so explains think- it right there <laughs> I think we've got a quality writer on our hands here for this. So you know. I personally think he belongs in the euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's one of the things, actually, looking at the behind the scenes on this, I did enjoy. The writers for this film were, um, I'm assuming, siblings or relatives. Um, it was Flip and Finn Cobbler, which I just, I, lo- I love those names. I just think they're, they're a little bit goofy. Nothing personal to Flip and Finn Cobbler. They they match the the tone so. Oh yeah, it almost feels like pseudonyms. Yeah, yeah. I also noticed the trivia, like really stretching it for trivia. Like the fun facts, fun facts, air quotes for this film were: this is the third film not produced by Illumination or Universal. Um, and there was another one <laughs> that said. The film fell into relative obscurity until it was picked up for DVD and Blu-ray release. And I was like, this film came out two (laughs) years ago. What do you mean obscurity? (laughs) Well, you know, considering you look at the likes of Abigail and movies like that, they're left in theaters for two weeks and then shucked off to streaming. I think that's obscurity comes very quickly nowadays. Hmm. I don't know, I'm probably still connected to the, the old hat world where obscurity is like one person in the mountain knows about it and you have to answer <laughs> their riddles three to get a copy of it. So are you saying that uh, Hundreds of Beavers is less obscure than this one? Um, I, You know what, I think so. I think Hundreds of Beavers, you know what, it's got character. I think, I think that this film could more easily fall into obscurity than Hundreds of Beavers. Hundreds of Beavers has the potential to actually really become a cult classic, and I don't think the mean one does. Yeah. Oh God, no. There's no way. No. Well, like it, like the no, that article absolutely. said. You know, it it doesn't have it doesn't have for whatever Terrifier the Terrifier series is because it does get gross quick in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, it's gore fest above and beyond anything else. But it does have a lot. It has a an interesting villain. It um has the potential to be good because it does go above and beyond for creative kills and all the rest. You know, but yeah, this this is. Not to call it a nothing burger because I think it did have some decent bits, but yeah, overall it's it's gonna go down as a lesser blood and honey just because it doesn't have enough to stand on its own in a unique way. See, this this could have all been avoided if they just made the Grinch more sexy. <laughs> I don't think that's gonna do anything for this. We already had sexy <laughs> Grinch. It's not something that twenty twenty four is going to twenty twenty two was going to accept. <laughs> Oh, snap, I just realized this film and Hundreds of Beavers came out the same year. Yeah, and the budgets are terribly different, yeah. Yeah, wow, I'm getting a a Dandy Warhol's Brian Jonestown experience (laughs) vibe from it. Well, I think we've probably said all we really need to say about the mean one. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's probably a good place as any to call this one good. We will be back soon to talk about more Grinches. But in the meantime, do you guys want to let people know where they can find you if they want more from you? Dan? Certainly. And uh, once again, thank you so much for having me on. Um, You can find me on YouTube, Letterboxd, and Twitter. Uh, You can find me under TYTD Reviews. We uh, regularly publish written reviews on Letterboxd, and we also have weekly uploads of cult and classic film reviews where we take films apart and see how they work. And thanks again. Yeah, Nikki? Uh, you can find me here on YouTube at Trivial Theater. I do a wide array of random, obscure, and straight-up bad movies. Um, I, I upload relatively frequently. Uh, nothing Grinch-related, but I'm sure you'll find something that is still <laughs> creature feature-esque enough for your tastes. Um, nothing near as sexy as Jim Carrey's Grinch, though, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, stop by and say hi. I'm sure you'll find something that is of interest. And John, again, thank you for having us. Yes, thanks for joining me. And we will see you next time to talk about more Grinches. 
Thanks for listening to every version ever. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe and follow my co-hosts as well. My link tree and all of our links will be in the description below. If you want more of my content, all my podcasts are available on YouTube as well as most podcast platforms. If you enjoyed this show, check out one of the other podcasts or check out my Patreon for bonus and extended episodes you won't find anywhere else. We'll be back soon with another brand new episode, so thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.